before I call on questions without notice, it's been brought to my attention that the member for Moncrief had in fact refused to withdraw a, uh, a statement when re required to do so by the Deputy Speaker, that the Deputy Speaker allowed the debate to continue for the sake of keeping the debate moving, but I'd indicate to the member for Moncrief that I take a very dim view of any refusal to do precisely as the Chair instructs. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. Why does the budget fail to provide tax relief for the four out of five Australian taxpayers earning less than $52,000 a year? The sales reps, the shop assistants, the technicians, the childcare workers, the teachers, the office workers, the backbone of the Australian economy. Prime Minister, aren't these the forgotten people? 8.5 million families and singles who miss out on tax relief. Why shouldn't these hard-working Australians Member have greater Robertson. incentive and encouragement to work overtime to help themselves and to grow the Australian economy? The Prime Minister. Well, Mr uh, Speaker, um, the priorities of this budget were to help families and encourage people to work harder and better themselves, Mr yeah. Speaker. And they are priorities that this government um, unapologetically asserts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the Leader of the Opposition can't even get his facts right. <laughs> the, the family benefits in this budget are the greatest family benefits delivered by any budget since World War II, yeah, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah. And for the Leader of the Opposition to get up here and, and say that hard-working families have missed out, hard-working families with two children entitled to family tax benefit A, and that's Four out of five families, Mr. Speaker, will be eligible within the next three months for, Mr. Speaker, $1,200 in additional family payments. Mr. Speaker, Order, in relation, will be eligible for additional payments in relation to each child, Mr. Speaker. We have deliberately, Mr. Speaker, decided to reward people who deserve to get some return. If they work a bit harder, Mr. Speaker, does the leader Member of the opposition for Bass. understand that in his own electorate of Werriwa, Mr. Speaker, there would be tens of thousands of full-time male earners, Mr. Speaker, and 37% of all full-time male earners in Australia now earn more than $52,000 a year, Mr. Speaker, and we regard it as unacceptable. Mr Speaker, Member that those people Lawler. should be bumped into a higher taxation bracket. Mr Speaker, I quoted the example of the police sergeant who works a bit of overtime. Well, according to some figures I've been given, Mr Speaker, it's not only the police sergeant, it is in fact the senior constable who in the New South Wales Police Force has an annual loaded salary of $54,033. And according to the philosophy of the Labor Party, he's rich, yeah, Mr. Speaker. Right. According to the philosophy of the man Member who is meant, who is meant Minister, to do something, Mr. Prime Speaker, who's call. meant to believe in encouraging people, according to that, uh, the philosophy of that person, Mr. Speaker. So we, we had a scale of priorities. The first priority was to fund necessary expenditure. The second priority, Mr. Speaker, was to provide family benefits. Member and the Coria. third priority, Mr Speaker, was to give taxation relief that would encourage incentive and hard work. And that is the basis of the decision that we've taken. The Leader of the Opposition, of course, in his question about other taxpayers, completely ignores the fact uh, that under the uh, changes to the tax system introduced as part of taxation reform, Mr Speaker, that a person on $20,000 is now paying $12 a week less than they did prior to tax reform, somebody on $30,000, $20 a week less than they did before tax reform, somebody on $45,000, $44 a week less than they did on tax reform, a tax reform that the Leader of the Opposition, may I remind him, Mr Speaker, opposed. When we tried to bring in these taxation changes, the Leader of the Opposition voted against them, Mr Speaker, and now he comes into this place of pleading the cause, Mr Speaker, of a group of people that he tried to stop getting very, very generous tax cuts, Mr Speaker. So I can simply say to the Leader of the Opposition, yes, uh, we, uh, we chose to give relief, Mr Speaker, to families, and we're proud of that, Mr Speaker. This is the most family-friendly budget Australia has ever seen, Mr Speaker. 
This is a budget that is seen to recognise the modern day realities of the Australian family, Mr Speaker, but it is also a budget that says to the people who want to better themselves, who are prepared to work harder, to do a bit of overtime, to strive to improve themselves, we're no longer going to clobber you with a tax rate of 42 cents in the dollar when you hit 52,000, Mr Speaker. What we're going to try and do in the good Australian way is to reward incentive reward effort and give you a pat on the back for trying harder. The Honourable Member for Canning. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer outline to the House how Australian families will immediately benefit from the measures announced in the budget? Would the Treasurer detail how these measures will reward the efforts of families? Treasurer. Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question, and I can inform the House that as a result of last night's budgets, Australia's 2.2 million families will benefit immediately with a $600 payment per child. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the legislation has been introduced into the House to provide I just heard an interjection from, uh, from one of the Labor Party members who said it's a bribe. Is that right? Order. Treasurer Mr. Speaker, remarks through well, the let, chair. It, let it go on the record that the Australian Labor Party is opposed to the $600 per family being paid before 30 June. We don't think it's a bribe, Mr. Speaker. We think it's justice for Australian families. And these are the people that are raising children, paying for food, paying for shelter. These are the people that are paying for childcare and education. Mr Speaker, and this government believes that those people deserve assistance and under the announcement that we made last night they will be eligible to receive a $600 per child benefit before the 30th of June. And Mr Speaker, can I say if it's a one child family it's $600, if it's a two child family it's $1200, if it's a three child family it's $1800. This is per child. In addition uh, to that, Mr. Speaker, uh, can I also say that? Uh, uh, in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, can I also say that there will be changes so that the ongoing increase in the family tax benefit Part A of $600 will be on an annual basis. And so, in relation to the 2003-2004 year, upon their reconciliation, Mr. Speaker, they will be eligible for another $600, which would mean within the first 12 months there is an eligibility to $1,200 uh, per child. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, before I uh, finish talking about the uh, benefits that, uh, that families will receive, and there are 2.2 million families, I do just want to pick up on uh, one thing, uh, Mr Speaker, because the Leader of the Opposition uh, repeated just now what the Labor Party has been saying all day. He said that there were 8.5 million families who didn't receive anything. Mr Speaker, that's what he said, and that's what their press release said last night. There are 8.5 million forgotten Australian families who don't receive a single cent. Now, Mr Speaker, I thought that was a funny figure, so I went to the Australian Bureau of Statistics. They, they say 8.5 million families miss out. I tender the Census of Population and Housing for 2001, which found that in Australia there are only 4.9 million families. <laughs> oh, uh, Treasurer has the call. Oh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Treasurer has I, the call. I also table Member because for Sturt. I, I want to warn Member the House. For Sturt. The I also the table the press release as it stood last night. 8.5 million forgotten Australian families, Mr. Speaker, because a second edition has been issued today, which has taken the offending line out. But for the sake of the record, and I notice I've said this before, when you go to the website, it gets airbrushed. It gets airbrushed. But I put the one, I table the one they put out last night, reaffirmed in question, and I table the extract from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. And I draw his attention to more than six million forgotten Australians in last night's budget, 
the families and singles who receive Order. not a single cent. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Order, Minister for Foreign Affairs. The Leader of the Opposition is entitled to be heard. The Leader of the Opposition. Member for McEwen. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I draw his attention to more than six million forgotten Australians in last night's budget, the families and singles who received not a single cent in tax relief or family assistance. Prime Minister, why has 60 per cent of the country received nothing, no return on bracket creep and no relief from the highest taxing government in Australia's history? When the Prime Minister was elected eight years ago, he said that he would govern for all of us. Why has he now forgotten about most of us, the great majority of the Australian people? Prime Minister. I notice that um, the Leader of the Member Opposition for is now using the expression forgotten people, Mr Speaker. This man plagiarism knows no bounds. <laughs> knows no bounds, Mr Speaker. Knows no bounds. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, you know, I can understand Clinton, Mr. Speaker, but to borrow the phrase of the great Menzies, that really is stretching it a bit far, Mr. Speaker. But, but let us let us continue. The leader of the opposition uh, says that uh, this budget uh, has uh, overlooked the needs of Australians, Mr. Speaker. Can I remind the leader of the opposition that uh, a budget is a continuum? of work that a government does over the whole time that it's been in office, Mr Speaker. And what, what the Leader of the Opposition, I know, finds very difficult to understand is that we have been able to deliver a magnificent budget because we have run the economy well, Mr Speaker. And one of the proudest things that I know the Treasurer feels about this budget, and I certainly feel about this budget, is that in very large measure Many of the significant benefits for families for Lawler. have been funded, Mr Speaker. They have been made possible by the fact that corporate tax collections have soared. And those tax collections have not soared because we have increased the rate of corporate tax. They have, in fact, we have reduced it. We cut Labor's corporate tax rate from 36 cents in the dollar to 30 cents in the dollar. But because we have run a strong economy, because we laid the foundations of sound economic management in our 1996 budget, because of that, Mr Speaker, we have seen strong and steady growth. We have seen a confident corporate sector employing millions of Australians, Mr Speaker. We have seen we didn't forget or overlook the 1.3 million Australians who have gained jobs since we have been in office, Mr Speaker. We haven't neglected any Australian, Mr Speaker, in delivering economic policies that have given us the lowest unemployment rate, Mr Speaker, in a generation, and we now have the double, the first time since 1968, Mr Speaker, of an inflation rate below 3 per cent and an unemployment rate below 6 per cent, Mr Speaker. It's no accident that we've paid off $70 billion of Labor's debt. Mr. Speaker, and by paying that off, we have six to seven billion dollars more a year that we can spend on defence and on health and on schools and on family benefits, Mr. Speaker. That is the human dividend, Mr. Speaker, of good economic management. And the leader of the opposition has got the gall to imply that we have forgotten Middle Australia. The honourable member for Daybell. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the treasurer. Would the Treasurer outline to the House the economic fundamentals that have enabled the government to assist families that deserve relief? Is the Treasurer aware of alternative policies that can put these fundamentals at risk? Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, well, I thank the honourable member for Dobell for his uh, question. And, uh, I can inform the House that Australia uh, in the next year will grow at 3.5 per cent, a growth rate which is uh, very solid and more importantly a growth rate which will be done on an inflation rate which is around 2 per cent. Mr Speaker, this is strong growth with low inflation. And the evidence is in the labour market. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, when the government was uh, elected, the unemployment was about 8.2 per cent. Today it's 5.6 per cent. And 1,300 million new jobs have been created in Australia since this government was elected. Uh, 
Mr. Speaker, if you have strong economic management, if you have growth and low inflation, if you balance your budgets, if you repay debt, Mr. Speaker, if more people go into the workforce and if companies are profitable, they will deliver to you revenues which can be used to help decent, ordinary, working Australian families. And that's what this government was able to do in this budget. Mr. But Mr. Speaker, this was the seventh surplus budget of this government, and we have now reduced Labor's debt from $96 billion in net terms to $26 billion. And Mr. Speaker, economic management is not an accident. It's not a fluke. It's not something that you look up on uh, the Google uh, search engine and try and uh, figure out uh, on a daily basis. It requires continued, strategic, stable management. And, Mr Speaker, these kinds of budget outcomes start with economic management, stable economic management, a medium-term monetary policy, a medium-term fiscal policy, the broadening of the indirect tax base, the cutting of the company tax rate, the halving of the capital gains tax, the abolition of the taxes on our exports, the reforming of the labour market, Mr Speaker. These are the reforms that have been building economic management in Australia, and alas, these are the reforms that were opposed hook, line and sinker by the Australian Labor Party. The Australian Labor Party would have you believe it likes the outcome, but it opposes the work that gets you there. Well, Mr Speaker, you don't have economic management by accident. It is sustained. It has to be kept up over the years. It has been kept up over the years by this government, and it will continue into the future. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Hotham. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer, and I ask the Treasurer to confirm that around 8.5 million Australian families and singles will receive— I repeat the question, Mr Speaker. Can the Treasurer confirm that around 8.5 million Australian families and singles will receive not one cent in tax cuts from the Treasurer's budget last night? Treasurer, why does someone like yourself deserve a $42 a week tax cut, while a teacher in Queensland earning $48,000 gets nothing in tax cuts from your budget? Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, the, first, the first point I make is you'll notice the phraseology of that question was 8.5 million families and singles. Yeah. Up, and, up until now, it's been 8.5 million families, which has been the Labor Party's line. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, Treasurer let me also call. point out that there are many millions of Australians who pay no tax, and you can't cut tax for people who don't pay it. Mr. Speaker, pensioners. Order. Well, pensioners don't Member pay tax. Member Hotham has asked Mr. Question. Speaker, and around one, the one million of the families, around one million of the families who are on family tax benefit Member Part A, Treasurer. do not pay tax. Mr. Speaker. Treasurer, resume his seat. The member for Hotham on a point of order. On the point of relevance, Mr. Member Speaker. for Hotham will resume his seat. Member for Hotham will resume his seat. Treasurer has the call. But, Mr. Speaker, um, I want to make two further points. Uh, the first, Mr. Speaker, is uh, that over the course of uh, this government's tax reform process, we have cut for lower and middle income earners taxes substantially. When we came to office, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, people on middle incomes were paying 34 and 43 cents, and we cut that to 30. People, people on lower incomes of 20,000 were paying 20 cents, and we cut that to 17. Mr. Speaker, but that part of our tax reform structural adjustment package, which applied to middle-income earners, did never clear the Senate because it was, a, it was opposed by the Australian Labor Party. That was the part, Mr. Speaker, that we went to the election, that we promised the Australian people about, and were never able to deliver. And Mr Speaker, now we return to that part and we deliver it to the middle income earners of Australia. And let me refer to page seven of uh, the book More Help for Families. Member what for is Brisbane. The, oh, I'll come to that in a moment too. What is the overall 
What is Member the overall Millen. effect of these tax changes? It's this. The taxpayers earning $20,000 have had a 23 per cent tax reduction. Taxpayers earning $50,000 a 21 per cent reduction. And taxpayers on $90,000 will have had an 18 per cent tax reduction. So, Mr Speaker, we're actually delivering more to the lower income end than we are to the upper end. Now, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I do want to come back to the last part of the question because the, the honourable member, member for Hotham, for I think, uh, said uh, that it was unfair that somebody like me would get a tax cut. I think that's uh, what he said uh, in his... Um, in his uh, well, I do actually um, want to refer to a transcript on the Howard Sattler program of the Leader of the Opposition today. Sattler, have you worked out with Mrs Latham over the phone at least how much more money Peter Costello is going to give you? Latham, I don't think we get anything. Sattler, must be something. We're part of the 60 per cent of the country that's been forgotten in this budget. <laughs> Now, Mr Speaker, I don't know what a Leader of the Opposition is paid, but a Leader of the Opposition, last time I looked, was paid more than $52,000. So, Mr Speaker, let's just round the circle here. The member for Hotham, the great opportunist, wants to complain that members of parliament are getting tax cuts. His leader is complaining that members of parliament aren't getting tax cuts out there on the Sattler program. It wasn't entirely an accurate answer, Mr Speaker, nor was it entirely accurate, as he said earlier, to say that 8.5 million Australian families missed out when there are only 4.9 families in Australia. Mr Speaker, it is a consistent pattern in relation to the way in which policy is being conducted, and I have said before that even if the Australian the Labor McMillan. Party doesn't know what their policy is, I do, and I read it, the and I take a great deal of interest in it. When the House has come to order, member for Herbert. Treasurer has the call. At Latham. Uh, on Perth Radio uh, 6PR, Wednesday, the 12th of May, 2004. Honourable Member for Petrie. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer outline to the House how taxes have unfairly penalised hardworking Australians, and would the Treasurer detail what measures will reward people for their efforts? Treasurer. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, as, uh, as I said earlier, uh, from 2000 on, when this government put forward a tax plan to reform the income tax assistance, we were able to deliver a cut to low-income earners of their marginal rate from 20 cents to 17 cents, Mr Speaker. Uh, for middle-income earners, who were then on 30 and 43 cent uh, brackets, we were able to deliver a reduction in their tax rates to 30 per cent. And Mr Speaker, the third leg of what we put forward in 2000 was for those that were above that rate to have a pushed out threshold so that average earners were not kicked into the top marginal tax rate. That was the leg that never cleared the Senate because the Australian Labor Party voted against it. Mr Speaker, that was the unfinished business in relation to the structural reform of the Australian taxation system, and that is the business that we have delivered on in this budget. And we have done it in conjunction with delivering to families, many of whom pay no tax at all and therefore would receive no benefit from an income tax cut. Can I say, Mr Speaker, after these changes have been put in place, after these changes have been put in place, the effect of those income tax cuts is that those on the lower income earners have still received the greatest proportion of income tax reduction since 2000. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, why do we do this? Well, the first reason we do it is this, that people who are on average earnings shouldn't face a marginal tax rate of 47 cents in the dollar. If you want uh, your senior constable or you want your fire officer to work harder, to go for a promotion, to do some overtime, you can't expect those people to be paying 47 cents in the dollar on each additional dollar that they earn. They are not the high income earners in our society, Mr Speaker. 
And so, as a matter of incentive and justice, we want to move that threshold. The second reason, Mr Speaker, is that Australia has to stay internationally competitive. We look around the world at other countries. They are not bringing their top tax rates in at a level like $62,500. Some of them, Mr Speaker, don't bring it in until well over $100,000. And that's why we have to move those rates to stay internationally competitive. And the third reason is this is the unfinished business. This is the part of the income tax restructure that never went through in the year 2000. And for many of these people who are now getting justice that they have been denied for the last four years, for the last four years, Mr Speaker, when the other income tax reductions were introduced. So we say to the Australian Labor Party and we say to the Senate, let's get on with this business. We're introducing these tax bills tomorrow. Let's pass them. Let's make sure that that incentive returns to the Australian taxation system from 1 July of this year. The Honourable Member for Hotham. Mr. Speaker, my question is again to the Treasurer, and I ask why isn't the, budget, the government's budget giving any tax cut to a hard-working teacher on $48,000 a year? Treasurer. Well, well, Mr Speaker, uh, for a hard-working teacher on $48,000 a year who is part of a family that will be delivered $600, well, the Treasurer has $600 the call. per child. The oh, member for Hotham has asked they'll be this question. They'll the be delivered $600 the call. per child. They'll be delivered $1,200 for two children. Mr Speaker, if that hard-working teacher has a second income earner, a second income earner working part-time, there will be an additional benefit under the Family Tax Payment Part B, which would deliver a hard-working teacher member for with two children on $48,000 around $50 a week in additional family assistance. Now, in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, every Australian, including that hard-working teacher, is entitled to a bonus of 150 per cent of any money which they set aside for retirement savings. That hard-working teacher under the Australian Labor Party, if they made a contribution into superannuation of $100, will get nothing. That's the Australian Labor Party policy. But under the measures which I announced last night, that hard-working teacher earning $48,000 who wanted to put $100 into their superannuation would get from the government as a co-contribution $150, $250 into their superannuation, Mr Speaker, as a benefit for increasing retirement savings. Mr Speaker, can I also say there are many hard-working teachers who will get the advantage of what the government introduced with the new safety net in relation to their medical bills when their children get bulk billing because they're under 16 or when their non-hospital costs go above $300, Mr Speaker, and they'll get an 80 per cent rebate. There will be many of those hard-working teachers who will have parents, Mr Speaker. Parents who are looking for aged care, and a $2.2 billion injection into aged care, Mr Speaker, will be a big part of it. But the Minister for Education will not let me go without saying this. That hard-working teacher will also see, as a consequence of this budget, another $8 billion delivered into the education system in this country. That's what they'll also see, Mr Speaker, an investment which will see the Commonwealth increase its commitment to education. And the last point I want to make is this, because we feel rather strongly about it on this side of the House. That hard-working teacher will have their wages in the government system paid by a state government, and those wages will be funded entirely by the GST. Because the GST, Mr Speaker, funds the salary of every teacher in every school, in every classroom in Australia, and the eight Labor governments which are now sharing the benefit of that, Mr Speaker, are all in a bonus position. A bonus. Uh, oh, Mr oh, Speaker, yes, the Treasurer has the call. The member for Bass just said no, they're not. Mr Speaker, member, Treasurer. the member for Bass's interjection was yeah. wrong. Every state is now in a bonus position. Treasurer has Mr. Speaker, every Treasurer I'm sorry, it was the member for Chisholm that uh, made that false interjection, not the member for Bass. Mr. Speaker, every state is now in a bonus position. 
Mr. Speaker, as appears from the budget overview. Uh, and can I say, in relation to the state of Victoria, the BRACS government will be getting a bonus of GST over and above financial assistance grants of over $270 million for the year. Mr. Speaker, $270 million. Member for Bendigo. $270 million would build Bendigo. half of the Scoresby Freeway. And the Scoresby Freeway has to be built over four years. So I say this to the member for Chisholm. Why not go to the Brax government and tell them to keep their promise? Where does the member for Chisholm I stand on the Scoresby the Freeway? You've got to stand somewhere. You're either for the Brax government keeping its word or you're for tolls. And the people of the eastern suburbs of Melbourne deserve to know which it is. I warn the member for Chisholm. Member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the Minister inform the House of action the government has taken in the budget to promote regional security? Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, Mr. Speaker, first, can I thank the honourable member for her uh, question and, and uh, the interest she shows in regional security? Because uh, one of the themes of the budget last night was the importance of reinforcing the security of our country at a time when we are subjected to the threat of international terrorism and broader international stability. And Mr Speaker, this is a budget that protects Australians and protects Australia's interests. One of the keys to our success in the war against ter terrorism is our intelligence community. And I I would like to take the opportunity in answer to the question of saying to the House that this is a government that takes great pride in the performance of our intelligence agencies. We think our intelligence agencies do an excellent job, um, and uh, I uh, regret that the Labor Party frequently attacks them because these are agencies made up of good and honourable people. Mr. Speaker, in this budget, we provide an additional $50 million over a four-year period for the Australian Secret Intelligence Service um, to enhance ASIS's counter-terrorism capabilities. Mr Speaker, there, has, uh, there will, as a result of this spending, have been a 138 per cent increase in funding for ASIS since this government came to office. Under the previous government, they thought they could take a peace dividend at the end of the Cold War, a Cold War won, by the way, by yeah. the United States, yeah. they thought they could take a peace dividend at the end of the Cold War and ran down our intelligence agencies, including ACES. And we have been rebuilding those intelligence agencies, and in this budget um, the funding for ACES increases very substantially. Equally, Mr Speaker, with the Pacific, this uh, budget once more focuses very strongly on increasing Australia's support for our near neighbours in the South Pacific. Overall, this budget provides for a doubling of funding for the Pacific Island, Island countries. And obviously, there is a very substantial emphasis on increasing support to Papua New Guinea as a result of the uh, agreed enhanced cooperation program between Member Australia and Sydney. Papua New Guinea in December of last year and uh, equally uh, a very strong commitment to the regional assistance mission in the Solomon Islands. Now, obviously, first and foremost, this support for the Pacific is important for the peoples of the Pacific themselves, but it is important to Australia because, in terms of our own interests, stable neighbours are important to our own, in, uh, our own security and the security of our people. Um, Mr Speaker, this enormous commitment to the Pacific is the greatest commitment by any Australian government to the Pacific since, uh, since 1975, since Papua New Guinea's independence. 
and I hear that if the Labor Party wins the next election, the member for Hotham becomes the treasurer, um, the, um, the Labor government will appoint a deputy minister for foreign affairs responsible for the Pacific. They will downgrade, they will downgrade responsibility for the Pacific to a junior minister and take it away from the foreign minister. For this government, we are doubling support in our budget for the Pacific, reinforcing our commitment to that region, to our friends and neighbours in the South Pacific, to enhance the stability and the strength of those countries. The Royal Member for Lilly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is directed to the Prime Minister, and it relates to the tables presented in last night's budget. Prime Minister, is it the case that these tables do not show the actual gain in weekly disposable incomes families will experience after 1 July this year? Prime Minister, is it the case that for a dual income family with two children, one under five, on $65,000 a year, the claimed weekly gain of $36.97 per week will translate into an actual zero increase in their weekly family income each week from the 1st of July. Isn't the Prime Minister just up to his own tricks again? Prime Minister, we are accurate. I'd point out to the, I'd point out to the Prime, Prime Minister, for the sake of the record, I was about to actually have a word with the member for Lilly about the latter part of his question. You hadn't been recognised by the chair, and I apologise for that. If you could repeat your answer, it will be on the hand side, but because I hadn't recognised you. Prime Minister. The, uh, Mr Speaker, the answer to the honourable member's question is that the tables prepared by the Federal Treasury are accurate. Yeah. The honourable member for Karangamite. Mr Speaker, my uh, question is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Would the Deputy Prime Minister advise the House of the benefits to regional businesses and the rural economy that will result from the measures announced in last night's federal budget? Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. And I can say at the outset that the people of regional Australia under this government are not the forgotten people. Mr Speaker, uh, they would, I would uh, point to, in the first instance the fact that country people like stability and certainty and decent economic management. They don't want wild enthusiasms and wild experiments from the son of Whitlam and his team over here, Mr Speaker. But, uh, I'd also note uh, that the Treasurer, I think, is interested that uh, country people uh, by and large like large families, so they welcome the, uh, the family package aspects of it as well. But, Mr Speaker, each year we publish what we call our little blue book, uh, and this year it's uh, available again, Regional Partnerships for Growth and Security, a statement by myself, Senator Ian Campbell and Deanne Kelly, my parliamentary secretary, Mr Speaker. And this book uh, runs to some 93 pages and contains initiative after initiative, both ongoing and new. And indeed, uh, if you simply turn to the overview, Mr. Speaker, it's a pretty impressive list. The, uh, the sugar package that the Prime Minister referred to yesterday, Mr. Speaker, Auslink, which, when you add in uh, the money that's been pre announced to the Australian Rail Track Corporation for rail reconstruction, some $872 million, means that over the next five years we will be oversighting of the order of $12.3 billion for roads and rail in Australia, which is around a 35 per cent increase uh, over recent years uh, on an annualised basis. Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, regional partnerships will see a boosting in funding of around $80 million to take it over $300 million. Sustainable regions will continue. Uh, the uh, uh, regional plans uh, will continue. The CAP program extraordinarily important, particularly in remote parts of the country. The Country Areas Program for Schools, 26 million, 22 for state schools, four for uh, Catholic and independents. And uh, extra funding for regional universities, very important indeed. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, further security, money for aviation security, airport security in regional Australia. And of course, uh, uh, we've got uh, the immigration and migrant programs, uh, Mr. Speaker, designed to help people, uh, migrants settle in rural areas. Substantial resources there. 830 million to continuing the rural health strategy, putting back the doctors and the allied health care 
people that we couldn't get in regional Australia because the Labor Party didn't train any for 13 years, Mr. Speaker. The higher brand uh, bandwidth incentive scheme, 107.8 million, now starting to flow. Mr. Speaker, just last week we launched in northwest New South Wales CDMA 1X. CDMA was the replacement mobile phone service we put in. There's more funding in this to roll out even more CDMA, but now that technology will give anyone who has access to it, Mr Speaker, broadband. You can sit out in the middle of the paddock or the middle of the highway in the middle of nowhere, and if you've got CDMA coverage, you can get broadband, Mr Speaker. And over and above that, Mr Speaker, just some uh, extras. You know, $54 million extra for the ABC to continue its uh, regional and local programming, Mr Speaker. And two, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's the wet tax reforms. Very welcome. Around $350 million means 90 per cent of Australia's wine producers, Mr Speaker, will effectively not pay any uh, wine equalisation tax, Mr Speaker, and that has been very widely welcomed. There's no doubt about it, Mr Speaker, we can say with total confidence that regional Australia knows that they are, in no sense of the word, the forgotten people under this coalition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The member for Lilly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is directed to the Prime Minister, and it relates to his last $1,000 family payment debt offset just before the 2001 federal election. Does the Prime Minister recall telling Laurie Oakes on the Sunday program on 1 July 2001 that the $1,000 family benefit debt offset was, and I quote, just for a transitional year, it won't be repeated, end of quote. Hasn't the Prime Minister repeated this Band-Aid family debt relief again in last night's budget? And Prime Minister, why shouldn't families believe Order. that you will claw back benefits after the election like you did last time? Order. Before I, re I recognise the Prime Minister, the member for Lilly is well aware that the reference to the Prime Minister through the chair as you is inappropriate. The Prime Minister. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there was uh, in answer to the member for Lilly, there was no clawing back last time. None whatsoever, Mr. Speaker. Order. Uh, no, none Prime whatsoever. And, uh, whilst, whilst, Mr. Speaker, I will go away and uh, uh, and uh, check the record, as I always do, not only with the member for Lilly but uh, with many others on the front bench. My recollection is that what we did in in uh, in 2001, Mr. Speaker, was not to provide a tax offset in relation to the debts, but in fact was to write the debts off, Mr Speaker, which is an entirely different thing. Honourable <laughs> Member for Macon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. <clears throat> member for Macon has the call. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Would the Minister inform the House how the government is strengthening Medicare and ensuring affordable access to high quality health care for all Australians? The Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader of the House. The Minister has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I do thank the member for Macon for a question, and I also thank her for her total commitment to Australia's Medicare system. And I can assure her that <laughs> last night's budget demonstrates that Medicare is safe with the Howard government. And, Mr Speaker, the figures tell the story. The, the figures prove. Uh, that this government is the best friend that Medicare has ever had. <laughs> Mr Speaker, federal health spending since 1996, federal health spending has doubled. Since 1996, health spending has increased from 14 per cent to 20 per cent of the federal budget. And Mr Speaker, since 1996, federal health spending has increased from 3.7 to 4.3 per cent of Australians' GDP. And we can afford to spend money on health because of the good economic management of the Treasurer and the Prime Minister. Now, Mr Speaker, last night's budget builds on the Medicare Plus package announced last November and strengthened in March. Medicare Plus was a $2.9 billion investment in Medicare, a $2.9 billion investment in structural improvements to the Medicare system, including a brand new safety net to ensure that 500,000 Australians, uh, 500,000 Australians face protection, had protections that they had never had before, and including for the first time allied health professionals such as physiotherapists and psychologists 
in the Medicare system. But, Mr. Speaker, last night's budget was a further investment in health security, health security for our nation and health security for some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Mr. Speaker, $114 million to build up the antiviral stockpile uh, in the event uh, of a new influenza pandemic and $40 million to enhance Australia's medical preparedness to meet any emergency or contingency. Mr Speaker, there's more money for profoundly deaf children, more money for a range of insulin-dependent diabetics, uh, money for the first time uh, for people who suffer from Fabry's disease and $40 million more to enhance the health of Indigenous people on top of the 100 per cent real increase in Indigenous-specific health funding since 1996. Mr. Speaker, this government is totally committed to Medicare. Medicare is an article of faith with this government. Mr. Speaker, we cannot make uh, our health system perfect because nothing is perfect uh, this side of eternity. But, Mr. Speaker, what we can do is continue to ensure that our system is the best health system in the world. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Lilly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, without notice, is directed to the Prime Minister, and it relates to the new $600 end-of-year debt offset in last night's budget. Prime Minister, is it the case that this payment has been designed to be delivered at the end of the year rather than fortnightly because it will be used to offset family benefit debts? Is it the case that one in three families may never see the $600 payment because it will be directly clawed back by the $900 average family benefit debt? Member Prime Paul Minister, Lindsay. don't families deserve better than this Band-Aid bribe? Prime Minister, we do thank the member for Lilly, and let every member in this house know that the member for Lilly is saying to all families that get family tax benefit A that the additional entitlement, when you take into account the one-off payment before the 30th of June for each child, the additional entitlement is $1,200 a child, Mr. Speaker. The additional entitlement, Order. and the member Order. for Lilly is calling this, Mr Speaker, a band-aid bribe, Mr Speaker. I mean, I thank the member for Lilly for providing us with, with some information to go in those letters that, from time to time, uh, we, write, we write to our constituents, Mr Speaker. I mean, the, the member for Lilly is so out of touch, Mr Speaker, the member for Lilly is so out of touch with the aspirations and needs of Australian families he, he contemptuously refers Member this for as Ballarat. a band-aid bribe, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's a, it's a measure of, of his concern about the relevance of this assistance that he should lapse into such absurd descriptions. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that there will be a $600 one-off payment completely unrelated, Mr. Speaker, to any overpayments. The $600, the next $600, Mr. Speaker. The next $600, Mr. Speaker, which will occur annually, and I happen to believe, and the government believes, that it's a good idea uh, to add to the family tax A benefit system, which is now available fortnightly if people want it. The idea of having a lump sum will be welcomed by Australian families, Mr. Speaker. Many Australian families welcome that uh, as a means, in, in a sense, of compulsory saving. That through the year they have this very generous fortnightly payment which meets the recurrent expenses. And at the end of the year, Mr Speaker, that additional $600, uh, which is available, Mr Speaker, obviously, as the Treasurer said last night, subject to any reconciliation, is available, Mr Speaker, for additional items. Mr. Speaker. It is a generous addition, Mr Speaker. It's far ahead of anything the Australian Labor Party expected us to offer, and that's why the member for Lilly is indulging in such absurd rhetoric. Member for Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Attorney General. Would the Attorney General advise the House on measures being taken by the government to increase Australia's ability to respond to terrorist threats and to provide improved protection for the Australian community? The Attorney General. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Patterson for his question because I know of his personal and ongoing interest in the security, the domestic security of the Australian people. 
and uh, he recognises, I think, as most members of the parliament uh, either understand clearly or should recognise, that the most fundamental right that any citizen enjoys is the right to live in safety and security. And the threat that is posed by international terrorism is of a substantial character and one which uh, any government has to give an absolute priority to addressing. Our response to uh, the changed circumstances, Mr Speaker, have meant that we have significantly better laws to deal with terrorists and to catch them before they have a chance to commit a crime in Australia. We have stronger terrorism fighting agencies with tools and support that they need to deal with this threat to our community. And we have very close international cooperation uh, because the war on terrorism is not a battle on which any one country can fight alone. Since September 11, 2001, the tragic attacks on the United States, this government has committed over $2.3 billion, Mr Speaker, over five years uh, to enhance over 100 different measures to better secure Australia. And last night we again delivered in relation to that, committing an extra $754.5 million to fund additional national security measures over the period of the forward estimates. Now, Mr Speaker, Australia's intelligence agencies stand at the front line of our security effort to protect the Australian community. The government has allocated to ASIO in particular over that four-year period an additional $131.4 million. This will enhance its operational, analytical and technical capacities, as well as strengthening border control measures and regional capacity building. ASIO's current staff Mr. Speaker, number around 785 people and have reached uh, the levels that we last saw at the time of the Cold War. And over the next three years, it's estimated that those staff levels will increase by a further 200 officers, representing a total increase in staffing of 79 per cent since September 11, 2001. Now, with this increased staffing that we've uh, implemented over time, uh, we now have the National Threat Assessment Centre operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Prime Minister opened it uh, two weeks ago a very important initiative of this government. We have also allocated $50.2 million over four years to nine agencies to enhance critical infrastructure uh, participation and protection. Now, uh, my department is the lead agency in relation to those matters. Mr Speaker, the government does take a leadership role in these matters, working with the private sector, the states and territories uh, to improve protection of critical infrastructure. Now our approach is very different to what I think I've seen elsewhere. Uh, I notice that the Australian Labor Party wants to trash the very effective arrangements that we have in place. It talks about introducing a Coast Guard, establishing a Department of Homeland Security, arrangements that might suit the United States, but which have uh, no justification in the Australian context. The only argument you might have in relation to a Department of Homeland Security was if our agencies we're operating in silos, as was seen elsewhere. That's never been the case. And if you look at the advice that was given by the Director General of uh, Security, Dennis Richardson, in the Senate in February, he said this, and I quote: "The connectivity between Australian border agencies is probably the best in the world. It is quite unusual for counterpart organisations globally to be able to check that directly from their desktop, as we can." Now, that interoperability is part of our first line of defence. Um, it's one in which Labor would want to weaken by simply changing the signs, rebadging, reorganising, distracting people from the important task of dealing with the terrorist risks that we face. Mr Speaker, this government is about getting on with the job of protecting the Australian community. All parliamentarians will want to join me in welcoming to the gallery this afternoon the 20 millionth visitor to Parliament House. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs Robin Kelly and her husband Dr Paul Kelly of Benella, Victoria were interrupted in their tour of Parliament House by the President and I this morning 
We were pleased to we were pleased to host them. We were pleased to host them to a, a morning tea and to make a presentation to them. And we're delighted that an indication of the very open access that Australians enjoy in this parliament is that effectively the population of Australia has now visited this building. And that's a credit to both sides of the House. The Honourable Member for Hotham. Mr. Uh, Speaker, my, treasurer, uh, my answer is to the Treasurer. <laughs> and it refers to an answer that the Treasurer earlier gave. Can the Treasurer confirm that he said earlier that a teacher on $48,000 would get a 150 per cent co contribution on voluntary superannuation contributions? Treasurer, isn't this wrong? Because under the budget initiative that you brought down, the benefit begins to phase out at $28,000, and that the teacher, rather than getting a 150 per cent co contribution, only gets a 50 per cent contribution. While the Treasurer is at it, can he finally bring himself to confirm that the same teacher will get not one cent by way of a tax cut from his budget? The Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I uh, thank the Honourable Member for his question. I think he misunderstands the uh, superannuation initiative we introduced. Well, uh, that is, Treasurer has the call. Every person is eligible for 150 per cent, as I said. The maximum that they can contribute phases out, but whatever their contribution, they get 150 per cent. So, Mr. Speaker. Oh, you don't know much. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, as I said, if you put in 100, you get 150. Right. If you put in 500, you get 750. And if you're eligible to put in 1,000, you get 1,500, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, it was right what I said, and I can Member confirm it. And, Mr. Speaker. Um, I thank the honourable member for his question because he has misrepresented again, again. our policy. Uh, now, Mr. Speaker, uh, while I'm on uh, my feet, uh, I would like to table for the benefit of uh, the hon honourable member for Chisholm in particular, the uh, benefit for uh, each and every uh, uh, state and territory under the GST um, arrangements, uh, and Mr. Speaker. Um, um, I think I said for Victoria it was 273 million. It's 237 million uh, bonus, Mr. Speaker. Uh, still, uh, still, still, still more than enough, Mr. Speaker, to uh, fund 50% of the Scoresby Freeway yes, this year, treasurer. and the bonus would pay for the balance of the treasurer. Scoresby Freeway uh, next year, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the table shows that uh, every state uh, is in a net benefit position. Including New South Wales, yeah. Mr. Speaker, treasurer, which will be in a net benefit position of 113 million point seven in 2004-5. The honourable member for Robertson, the chief government whip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Ageing. Would the minister advise the House what the government is doing to secure the future of aged care for older Australians? Is the minister aware of alternative policies? The Minister for Ageing. Minister for Ageing has the Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Robertson for his question. And I know that older Australians in his electorate, indeed older Australians across Australia and their families, will welcome the fact that through economic management of this government and through the successive surplus budgets, this government is able to invest a further $2.2 billion into the aged care needs of older Australians. Mr Speaker, on top of the record levels of funding, record allocations of aged care places, we have ensured that through this budget, older Australians will continue to receive high quality, accessible, affordable care that meets their individual needs. Specifically, Mr Speaker, we have allocated more places in community and residential care. Some 27,900 new places will be allocated over the next three years. The member for Robertson will be interested to know that 8,000 
575 places in New South Wales alone will be allocated over the next three years. In fact, some 4,125 in New South Wales this year, 2004. A total of 13,030 new places for older Australians across our nation. Mr. Speaker, secondly, we are ensuring that better care can continue to be delivered. We have increased the subsidy paid by the Australian government to some $877.8 million over four years. This means that the current average subsidy paid per resident of $30,500 will increase to some $35,380 within the next four years. Mr Speaker, we have also ensured that nearly $1 billion of increased capital funding will be made available to the sector to ensure that they can refurbish, upgrade and meet capital requirements of the sector. This will include $513.3 million paid to the aged care sector by 30th of June this year, that is $3,500 per resident, funding that will go towards better accommodation and meeting accommodation needs of our older Australians. And Mr Speaker, we've also concentrated on the workforce to ensure that there is an opportunity for training and career paths in aged care, a $101.4 million package for aged care nursing in addition to the training places and scholarships that are already available to ensure that not only do we attract but we retain quality aged care staff. Mr Speaker, there are a range of initiatives in the aged care budget that support this $2.2 billion investment on top of the funding of $6 billion that this government has currently made. It means that from today until 2008, this government will invest $30 billion dollars into the aged care needs of older Australians. Mr Speaker, I'm asked about an alternative policy. I'm afraid to confirm that there is none. The opposition have no policies, no plans, no vision for the care needs of older Australia. And I'm proud that this government is ensuring that older Australians receive the right care at the right time and in the right place, for this government cares about older Australians. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer to his statement last month when he said, uh, our position remains that we have certain things we've got to spend money on, and if there's room, then we'll provide tax relief. Why doesn't the Prime Minister believe that a vaccine against the deadly pneumococcal disease that kills 50 Australian children a year is something the government should spend money on in its budget? Prime Minister. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Um, in relation to the pneumococcal vaccine, the government continues to subsidise it for people at high risk. That's all Indigenous children and children with medical risk factors can access free vaccine under the National Immunisation Program. Adults aged 65 years and over and those with high medical risk can access the adult vaccine on prescription by their GP, subsidised by the government through the MBS and the PBS. And, Mr Speaker, we continue to review the remaining recommendations made by the Australian Order. Technical Group. Prime Minister has the but, call. Mr Speaker, can I just point, uh, can I just point out to the uh, House, Mr Speaker, Member that the, uh, the government, this government, I mean, it's very interesting that the Leader of the Opposition is raising questions about immunisation. Can I remind him that immunisation rates were as low as 53 per cent in 1989-90, and I don't think we were in government, Mr. Speaker. In 1989-90, for children at 12 months of age, at 12 months of age, Mr. Speaker, at 12 months of age in 1989-90, immunisation rates in this country were as low as 53%, Mr. Children, Member for children Bass. at 12 months of age, Mr. Speaker. That was a national disgrace. Under Labor, Mr. The Speaker, for the immunisation rates of this country had fallen to third world levels, and it took the work of the former health minister, Michael Woolridge, as a member of the Howard government, Mr Speaker, to bring those levels back to acceptable standards for a modern society. Mr Speaker, since the introduction of the Howard government's Immunise Australia program, childhood immunisation coverage rates have increased to an all-time high with over 90 per cent of children, 90 per cent, Mr Speaker, 
uh, at 12 months of age are fully immunised, Mr. Speaker. So we've gone from 53 under Labor, Mr. Speaker, to 90 per cent. We're not talking here about adults. We're talking, we're talking about children at 12 months of age, Mr. Speaker. That is our record on immunisation. The Labor Party ought to be permanently ashamed of how it neglected the immunisation of children when it was last in government. Yeah. Honourable Member for Blair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs. Uh, would the Minister outline to the House how families will benefit from additional childcare places? Yeah. Minister for Children and Youth Affairs. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank the Member for Blair. I know who's making his own, and his family's making his own contribution to the Australian children. Uh, but last night, Mr. Speaker, was a terrific night for, for families and particularly for young children. Indeed, with the announcements we made, an additional $251 million that went to childcare that builds on the $8 billion that we've committed now over the next four years, and that specifically targets outside school hours care and family day care. Indeed, $97.1 million goes to 30,000 new outside school hour care places. Of course, we also made an announcement at the end of last year of 10,000 places, so that's 40,000 places, and I've been advised that that will eliminate all the unmet demand that we have for outside school hours care across Australia. In the area of family day care, last night 1,500 more places for family day care, and of course that was in addition to the 2,500 that we announced at the end of last year, and I've also been advised by my department that that will also effectively remove all the unmet demand in family daycare. And of course, there is the commitment for those parents who perhaps want to stay at home of thousands of places in playgroups. Now, Mr. Speaker, the other area where we're putting more money into childcare is called the Childcare Support Program, very important, which underpins a lot of the accessibility to childcare and also maintaining quality. And part of that, of course, is the long day care incentive scheme, where we want to try and encourage uh, long day private care uh, or child care in outer metropolitan areas or in rural areas where there's unmet demand. And Mr. Speaker, when you look at the child care benefit, average payment is $2,000 per family. When, of course, you look at the family tax benefits now that will be coming through. Uh, for average families with two children, $1,200 before the end of the year, another $1,200 when they reconcile. There's no doubt that this is a wonderful budget, and I'd like to just uh, state from the peak organisation, the peak uh, children's services organisation in Australia, Early Childhood, Early Childhood Australia, and their spokesperson said this: "Taken together, the maternity payment, the changes to other family payments, and the gains in childcare places." make this budget the best one for children and families in many, many years. Yeah, yeah. Makes this budget the best one for families in many, many years. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the fact is that this government is absolutely committed to looking after children and parents. And if you really want to help children, you've got to help parents. And if you help parents, you help families. And if you help families, you build stronger communities. And that's what this budget and government is all about. Yeah. Honourable Member for Corio. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Treasurer, did, do you agree with the comments made this morning about the budget by the member for Kalgoorlie, uh, that is, it's enough to make you spit, and that regional and remote Australia has been overlooked? <laughs> Treasurer. Mr Speaker, well, I don't agree that regional and uh, rural Australia has been uh, overlooked. In fact, rural and regional Australia are great winners from this budget. Mr Speaker, uh, and in fact, uh, I will table uh, the uh, regional partnerships for growth and security. Can I say, Mr Speaker, Member for rural and regional Australia, Lawler. I think it's $1.1 billion in drought assistance. For rural and regional Australia, there is a $3.1 billion increase in Auslink including a $450 million uh, capital injection into the Australian Road Rail Track Corporation. Member Mr Speaker, for, for Rural and Regional Australia— Member for Swan. For Treasurer, 
The member for Corio on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, on relevance, uh, the question asked the Treasurer whether he agreed with comments made this morning about the budget by the member for Kalgoorlie that it is enough to make you spit and that regional and remote Australia has been overlooked. The will resume his seat. There is no point of order. The Treasurer is enti referring entirely to regional issues, as I heard him. Speaker, I was just talking about the benefits for regional and remote Australia, and I'm very, very happy to continue to do so. Drought assistance, Mr Speaker, Auslink, as I, I already, uh, already indicated, Mr Speaker. Uh, rural and remote Australia, I would think, uh, would include the sugar industry, would it not, of uh, North Queensland, which has got a package of uh, 445 uh, million uh, from uh, recollection, Mr. Speaker. Uh, regional Australia would include uh, the 90 per cent of Australia's wine growers that are exempted from the wine equalisation tax. Regional and remote Australia would include uh, those, peop those rural and remote councils that have received funding under the Roads to Recovery package to uh, build their, their local roads and their black spots, Mr. Speaker. And their drought for if has anyone else wants to add any measures in, I'm open to offers. Uh, Minister for Science. Mr. Treasurer. Speaker, uh, in fact, this is a uh, budget which uh, delivers big time for uh, uh, regional and remote uh, Australia. Mr. Speaker, we're pleased to do it because we believe in regional and remote uh, Australia. And we know that the best thing you can do for regional and remote Australia is to run an economy where it gives them opportunity and jobs as well, Mr Speaker. And this government is committed to regional and remote Australia. Yeah. The member for Dunkley. Uh, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Environment and Heritage. Would the Minister inform the House of initiatives in last night's budget to further protect and enhance Australia's natural systems? Is the Minister aware of any alternative policies? Minister for the Environment and Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd um, like to acknowledge the uh, great work that the member for Dunkley does in uh, c contributing to the government's environment programs. Uh, last night's uh, budget, Mr. Speaker, confirmed two things. One is that good economic management, leading to wealth creation, puts Australia in a position where it can increase funding for national environment programs. And the second thing that the budget confirmed last night is that this government is doing more to protect and repair the environment in Australia than any previous government in Australia's history. Uh, in this coming year, Mr Speaker, the Howard government is spending on the environment will rise by some 20 per cent to $2.4 billion a year which is by far the largest commitment that any Australian government has ever Member made to the protection and conservation of our environment. The great success of this government in repairing the environment Mr. Speaker, has been the partnerships that the government has established with local communities in the task of environmental repair. And since 1996, some 420,000 Australians from all walks of life have been involved in environmental repair funded under the Natural Heritage Trust. This budget commits another $300 million to the Natural Heritage Trust, uh, which will fuel the biggest environmental effort in our history. It will allow regional communities to plan ahead, uh, to have confidence that they will continue to be funded in the main priorities of environmental repair. And on top of this, of course, the budget has provided another $80 million to Landcare, which is one of the key programs for mobilising volunteers in environmental repair and resource management in regional and rural Australia. In fact, in the coming year, the expenditure under the NHT and the National Action Plan for Salinity and Water Quality will be almost $100 million more than it was last year. Now, Mr Speaker, it's quite clear that the Labor Party doesn't like the Natural Heritage Trust. And we had a press release from the Shadow Minister on Monday in which he attacked the National Heritage Trust as ineffective. Uh, he said that uh, there should be no more money. There should be no more money for the Natural Heritage Trust. And what, what is now quite clear, Mr Speaker, 
is that the Labor Party, if it ever came to government, would abolish the National Heritage Trust. It would wind up the trust. Uh, it, it, would, it would put an end to the community-based environmental repair programs that this government's funded and would replace these with centralised bureaucratic programs of the kind that Labor put in place in the past. Mr Speaker, on July 1 the historic enhancement of the protection of the Great Barrier Reef comes into effect and the budget provides $174.6 million for the protection of Australia's greatest natural icon over the next four years, an increase of $20 million. The budget also records the fact that this government takes climate change very seriously and provides another, an additional $70 million for climate change programs to uh, bake greenhouse gases in this country. Uh, this government has now committed over $1 billion to greenhouse gas abatement and has made Australia a leader in the world in this area. Mr Speaker, in short, this is the best budget for the environment yeah, yeah. that any Australian government has brought down, and it is the dividend of the outstanding economic management of the Howard government. Prime Minister. Mr uh, Speaker, uh, yesterday the member for Chifley um, asked me a question regarding the um, a development of a park and sporting complex at the former 80 I site in St Mary's. And, uh, Mr Speaker, I uh, would like to, um, with your leave, uh, sir. Well, as I recall, the Prime Minister offered to get back to the member for Chief. So offered to get back to him. Well, so, I'm no, 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 so that I would have thought entirely consistent to add to the answer. Oh, thank this you. Occasion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, uh, I've, sought, I've sought advice on this matter, and, uh, Mr Speaker, um, uh, the, the government gave detailed consideration to land use issues, including the development of a recreation park at the St Mary's site in the context of the Comland scoping study which was announced in the 2002-2003 budget and completed in March 2003. As a consequence, Lendlease, which is the developer, has undertaken to develop a 100 hectare park and sporting precinct at St Mary's under the Comland share sale agreement executed on the 22nd of January 2004. While the terms of the sale agreement contain information that is commercially sensitive, I can confirm that the facility will be funded and provided by Lendlease. Subject to planning approval of the specific facilities to be included in the recreation park, it is intended that the park will include outdoor playing fields, a synthetic all-weather field, tennis, netball and basketball courts, cycleways, walking trails, picnic and, Mr Speaker, barbecue areas. <laughs> Mr Speaker, uh, this is, um, Mr Speaker, may I point out to the House that this is entirely consistent with the announcement that I made in the presence of the member for Lindsay uh, on the 20th of February 2004. I have written uh, uh, to um, uh, the Honourable Member for Chifley uh, and uh, I have copied my response uh, to the uh, Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister and Member for Lindsay and also to the Minister for Finance and Administration, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. The mem member for Kalgoorlie will resume his seat. The Chair has spent a question time tolerating a large number of interjections from the member for Lawler. A good deal of Tolerance is given to her as manager of opposition business. She will exercise more restraint. The member for Kalgoorlie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I wish to make a personal explanation. Does the member for Kalgoorlie claim to have been misrepresented? Yes, I do, most certainly. Mr. Member Speaker. for Kalgoorlie may proceed. Uh, during question time, I was, uh, it was stated that I had, in response to the budget at large referred to the fact that it had enough to make me spit. Nothing could be further from the truth. I was had the asker of the question had the asker of the question been fulsome and truthful in his question, he would have known that I was referring specifically to a unique requirement for the Kalgoorlie electorate, and that is a mention and that is a request a long time standing over six budgets for a consideration of the taxation zone rebates. There could nothing 
It could not be further from the truth, therefore, that when referring to this budget, the most family-friendly budget Order. passed down in decades, Order. that I would Order. want Member to say Kalgoorlie. it made me spit. Member for Kalgoorlie is indicated where he is represented and will resume his seat. Member for Maribyrnong. The Honourable Member for Moncrief. Uh, Mr Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the Member for Moncrief claim to have been misrepresented? I certainly have in two areas, Mr Speaker. The Member for Moncrief may proceed. Thank you. The first of the two areas was with regard to comments that the Leader of the Opposition made, remarks that he alleges that I made to him as part of his debate in the Parliamentary Superannuation Bill of 2004. The remarks he alleges I made were completely false and a complete fabrication. The second, the second area that I'd like to raise, the second area I'd like to raise, Mr. Speaker, was with respect to the assertion that the leader of the opposition said when he said that he felt that he was under threat as he went into the cafeteria. I'd simply highlight, Mr. Speaker, that while the leader of the opposition may resort to violence to settle disagreements, I certainly Lord, do not. Member Moncrief, resume his seat. Order. Are there any papers for presentation? The Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader. Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister for Health and Ageing will Mr. just wait a moment. I recognised I'd called him, but been interrupted. The Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, papers are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. I thank the Leader of the House.